Good morning. I'm Deb Sullivan Trainer. I'm the Acting Dean of College of Arts and Sciences and want to welcome you to Prime Time. Prime Time is a really great collaboration between the Friends of the BU Library, Faculty Development, and some other offices. And it's a place where we celebrate learning beyond the classroom as well as an opportunity to learn about how we do things within the classroom. Today we have one of the three Ed Grin presentations that we um, will have this year. And Ed Grin Scholars Program is a really special, again, kind of a collaboration, just like the prime time is. It's a collaboration between students and faculty <coughs> to work on a research project. So faculty apply um, for this program. The, they are evaluated on the quality of their project and on the amount of collaboration that there will be between the faculty member and the student because we really want it to be a joint work together. So, um, and it's named after uh, the founder of Bethlehem University, who's uh, Alec John Alexis Edgren, and he, one of his important principles was this equality and working, be working together between faculty and students. So we established this program in his name because it really captured one of his philosophies of higher education. So today we have uh, two of our colleagues from the psychology department. Um, Megan Flynn, who's assistant professor of psychology, and Ingrid Latsas, who's a double major in psychology, and I know her through her other major in French. So um, I think she said she is going to do the presentation in English. Um, <laughs> but we'll um, let the two of them start and tell us about their project on peer victimization. Sure. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and the type of research that I do and then provide an introduction to Ingrid. And really she's going to do the uh, majority of the presentation today and I'll chime in wherever I see fit. And she has asked that you um, ask your questions as they come about so you don't need to hold off on asking the questions until the end. So my research falls in a field called developmental psychopathology and in particular I study predictors and consequences of adolescent depression. So uh, we know that, as Ingrid will tell you, the transition to adolescence is a really critical time to study the onset of depression. We know that rates increase dramatically, particularly for girls, and that the best predictor of an, a later episode of depression is having one during adolescence. So it's a really important time for both intervention and prevention um, efforts. To do the type of research we do, we have to study developmental processes. We have to have multiple assessments with the same group of kids, which means we do these complicated longitudinal studies uh, that take a lot of effort. And when I came to Bethel, Ingrid approached me immediately wanting to do research in developmental psychology. And uh, we didn't have any then, and we've done a lot of work since. Ingrid has done a tremendous amount of work helping organize a study that we have going on right now with middle school students. Um, Ingrid graduated in uh, December with honors. She was involved in many psychology club activities. What I think is most impressive about Ingrid is that she has uh, done a poster for the MUPC, which is an undergraduate uh, graduate psychology conference. She did a national uh, poster for an undergraduate psychology conference. She got a poster accepted at a professional conference that uh, we go to, we as faculty members, and her fourth project involves what she's going to tell you about today, which is the research that she did with the Edgar uh, Scholars Award. So with that, I'll let her jump in. Thanks, Megan. As Megan said, I'm Ingrid Gatsis uh, from the Department of Psychology, and the title of today's presentation will be Interactive Effects of Stress Responses and Peer Victimization on Youth Depression. So first, just to define some terms, I know there are a lot of non-psychology majors here, are, uh, the, one of the big terms is peer victimization, which you might know better as bully. It's kids victimizing other kids. So we have two main types of victimization. There's overt victimization, which is your classic form of bullying, kicking, pushing, hair pulling, that kind of stuff. There's also relational victimization, which is more verbal, or like, I'm not gonna sit with you at lunch, I'm not gonna talk to you, you can't come over to my house after school, more of that type of victimization. Now there's two ways to look at this. Um, you can look at overt and relational victimization apart, or you can look at them together, which is what we're going to be doing in this case. Peer victimization is a common form of interpersonal stress, and it's a good measure of interpersonal stress because at some time everyone will experience peer victimization. It also elicits, as you probably know, negative emotional interactions, which forces kids to have stress responses, which we'll talk about later. There's also a well-established link between victimization and depression through a body of research. 
Um, these are just some of the studies that have shown that. The first relationship we're going to talk about is stress responses and depression. So stress responses is just simply how do you respond to stress. And in particular, we're looking at interpersonal stress with peer victimization. So there's voluntary and involuntary. So voluntary is when you're choosing to do something or effortly trying to do something, whereas involuntary is when it's happening on its own. Engagement, and then there's engagement and disengagement. So engagement would be confronting the problem head on and interacting with it, while whereas disengagement is backing off and ignoring the problem. There's a robust effect of maladaptive coping and depression, meaning that um, less voluntary engagement, which is considered the adaptive or healthy type of coping, is associated with more depression and more involuntary or, and disengagement responses, which are considered unhealthy, are associated with more levels of depression. So there, these are the four types of stress responses we'll be talking about. Voluntary engagement, voluntary disengagement, involuntary engagement, and involuntary disengagement. The first type, of, this is our adaptive coping form, the form that's considered healthy, is voluntary engagement, which includes problem solving, seeking help or advice, emotional regulation, and positive thinking. The next three types are all maladaptive or bad forms of coping. Um, voluntary disengagement includes wishful thinking, denial, avoidance, and distraction. So to remember this, this is a student or a child choosing not to interact with the situation by distracting himself or avoiding the situation. The next type is involuntary. So the student is not choosing to interact with the situation, but is anyway. This includes rumination or thinking about something over and over, intrusive thoughts, emotional arousal, and impulsive action. The last type is involuntary disengagement and includes emotional numbing, inaction, and escape, and as well as cognitive interview. Our main research questions for this project were, does victimization predict depression over time? We know that they're correlated, but we wanted to see if there was a pattern of one predicting the other. Another is, do adaptive coping skills protect against depression, and do maladaptive coping skills contribute to depression? And one thing we know from a large body of research is that uh, the transition to adolescence is very important and rates of depression increased dramatically during this time, which is what Megan said. Also, adolescent episodes predict subsequent episodes later on, and, uh, and this is a critical period of intervention and prevention of depression. So just to give you a quick project overview, as Megan said, this is a longitudinal study that started when our students were in sixth grade, and Megan hopes to continue until they're in eighth grade. So we're going to look at the three-year period. And we're hoping to learn more about early adolescence and the transition in middle school. And overall, we're just looking how do these variables change and how they interact. My particular interest is in victimization, which is what we'll talk more about. With our method, we were able to go into a suburban middle school and, into, and through um, a survey, the Qualtrics survey, survey software, interview all the students in that particular grade. The first phase of the project, phase one, was in January of 2012 when the students were in sixth grade. And phase two was this past December when the students were in second grade. Now with the Edgar Grant, we were able to bring students in over the summer and have kind of a second phase, but not all students were able to participate in that because of limited resources. So these are our three phases of the project so far. The measures we used, obviously we used many more measures in the entire study, but we're just going to be focusing on three today. The first is the social experience questionnaire, which looks at victimization and assesses the occurrence of overt and relational victimization on a five-point scale from never to all the time. So an example of questions would be, how often does a friend who is mad at you ignore you or stop talking to you, which is an example of relational victimization, or how often do you get hit by another kid, which would be overt victimization. So for the overt scale, we have 11 items with the reliability of, uh, of 0.90, and for relational victimization, we have 10 items also with the strong one. Yes, Andy? So on this, it sounds like this is looking at victimization originating from 
school environment or from friends and peers? Yes, and that's actually a good question. Something specific about this questionnaire was it asked only at school. We're not interested in siblings picking on another or kids in the neighborhood. Only at school. Uh, that's all. So not family sources. Exactly. Okay. Like in the ACES study from the CDC. Uh, yeah. Good question. Um, and as I said before, there are two ways to look at this. You can look at these separately, but we chose to look at these together. So students will have an overall mean victimization score that we'll look at later. Uh, the next questionnaire is the responses to stress questionnaire, which measures coping, voluntary coping and involuntary coping response. So it distinguishes engagement versus disengagement coping, and the participants responded on a four-point scale. This particular measure has a high reliability in new samples and convergent validity with other coping measures, which means that it's measuring other samples. So there are four subscales of this measure, and they're the same four types of coping we talked about before. Voluntary engagement, voluntary disengagement, involuntary engagement, and involuntary disengagement. So they obviously have different items and very reliability, but overall we had a good reliability in this. The last questionnaire is the short mood and feeling questionnaire, which measures child and adult depression, uh, sorry, adolescent depression. And this is actually important because depression looks different in children and adolescents than in adults. So this is a 13th question questionnaire with established reliability in this sample. The reason there are two reliabilities here is we actually looked at two different time points for depression, which I'll talk about again later. And this particular measure has been shown to distinguish between clinically depressed and not depressed kids, which again is just another uh, another sign that this is a good measure that we can use. So going into our analytic approach, our first research question was, does victimization predict depression over time? And in this sample, no, it was not significant. But the small sample size meant that we weren't able to look at gender differences and the different types of victimization. So perhaps later on in the study when we have more data, there will, um, a pattern will emerge. So we did chose to look at moderation, which is when a third variable determines the relationship between two other variables. And we decided to look at victimization as a moderator. And we hypothesized that relation, the relationship between stress responses and depression would be different between high victimized groups and low victimized groups. So just to explain moderation, this is an example. So if you have these two variables, and you can see that um, in this example, this is boys and girls. So you can see that there's a different pattern in girls than in boys. And this means that whatever this third variable is, is explaining or moderating the relationship. So this is an example of a categorical moderator. But today we'll be looking at a continuous moderator where we have three categories, high, medium, and low. And what this means is that we've split up our, vari um, our third variable into three categories by standard deviations. So high represents one standard deviation above the mean, medium represents at the mean, and low represents one standard deviation below the mean. So as you can see, there's a different pattern emerging. If you were just to look at this overall, you might not see a strong pattern because there's such a difference between the low group and the high group. So for our analytic approach, we centered all the variables, which means we set the mean of all of the variables at zero. We then created four interaction terms, which means that, um, I'm sorry, the interaction terms are between stress response and victimization. So basically you're seeing how those variables interact and then plug them into an equation later. And the equation we plugged them into were our two step regressions. So the first step was our Edgren victimization and our Edgren stress responses predicting time to depression. So here, then we had our interaction terms predicting time to depression. And what this does is it controls for the effect of the interaction between the two terms. All of these analyses controlled for prior levels of depression, so these are truly longitudinal. We forgot to put that in there. So, we're stronger. Yes. <laughs> and this is our correlation table um, with victimization, voluntary engagement, and our other coping skills, and depression. It's important to note that these are all for that second time point, the Edgren, which was over the summer, and this was time to which was last December when the students were in seventh grade. 
So some important numbers to pick out, you can see that voluntary engagement or healthy type of coping is negatively correlated with victimization and oppression, which is what we expected to see. We also expected to see our maladaptive or negative forms of coping to be um, associated positively with victimization and oppression, which you see in the red. And our voluntary disengagement coping was not significantly correlated, so I won't be showing you a graph for those for that subscale. Uh, next up are the graphs. I'm just going to explain them first, so you're not confused. The, uh, the stress response and the victimization was divided into three groups because they are continuous variables. So there's high, medium, and low. Again, high is the first, the one standard deviation above the mean. Medium is at the mean and low is one standard deviation below them, which allows us to graph a continuous variable like this. This first graph is voluntary engagement, and I don't know if you can read this, but this is depressive symptoms here and voluntary engagement coping going from low to high. And these different lines represent the different victimization groups. So our high victimization group is this dark line, medium is this dashed line, and low victimization is the um, most dashed line here. And as you can see, there's a different pattern emerging between the different levels of victimization. For a lowest victimization group, this line isn't even significant. But for a highest victimization group, this is a very significant relationship showing that students who exhibit high levels of this positive coping, as well as high levels of victimization, experience much lower levels of depression than their peers who do not use this positive level, um, positive type of coping. Our next graph is for involuntary engagement, which if you remember, that's our um, rumination and impulsive action group. And for this, we see an opposite pattern emerging, that students who use more of this coping are more likely to experience depressive symptoms. And again, we're seeing a difference between the high victimization group, where this is a significant line, and the low victimization group, where this is a non-significant line. Finally, we have our involuntary disengagement group. And as you can see, this graph is different from the rest because there are very different patterns emerging between the three groups. But if we look at the numbers, you can see that for the low victimization and the median victimization, these aren't significant patterns, whereas for the high victimization group, higher levels of disengagement coping, oh, sorry, involuntary disengagement coping are predicting much more depressive symptoms. So what does this all mean? This means uh, our findings show that victimization determined the relationship be between three types of stress responses and depression. Uh, for voluntary engagement, but not disengagement, and for both types of involuntary responses. Um, also, for victimized, but not non-victimized youth, we found that adaptive responses predict lower levels of depressive symptoms, and maladaptive responses predicted higher depression. And the relationship is consistently stronger for youth under higher levels of personal stress. So some implications of these findings is first prevention, that we can teach students effective stress responses, for example, promoting adaptive coping and minimizing maladaptive coping responses. So students are better, better able to deal with interpersonal stress. Also, this allows us to intervene for victimized students because we know that students who are experiencing higher levels of interpersonal stress are much more at risk for experiencing depression and their coping skills are a lot more important and this can be used to create programs to reduce bullying and aggression as well. We'd like to say thank you to the various um, groups who gave grants to fund our project. Thank you. So do people have questions that they'd like to ask Ingrid or myself? We have Many minutes here, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you do you know much about the group with the they they had the, the good reaction basically the voluntary reaction? Yeah. So yeah. do they? Because I'm if these are middle school students, do we know are they were they a part of a program? Were they part of are they they just learning these skills on their own? They just naturally had these skills to be mm -hmm. able to to do that? Because I'm thinking a lot of middle school students might not necessarily have those types of skills to be able to do that or naturally come up with those types of 
You'd be surprised, actually, in the research that we do, um, in, in beginning even in second and third grade, you see a lot of kids who have positive perceptions of themselves will say that they do these good types of coping okay. as well. Uh -huh. So it's hard to say whether it's perceived coping efficacy, in other words, how much I believe I am capable of coping in these situations as opposed to how much they actually are using that in those situations. Studies that are really, really interested in the in just stress responses will do convergent types of studies where they will ask kids and then observe kids to try to get at that relationship. And um, I don't think the correlations are astoundingly high, which you know you never know. But um, we do see a lot of, of people reporting uh, that they respond adaptively mm -hmm. in interpersonal situations. Are you yes. surprised at all by like the? So with the um, different groups of victimization, the, where the mean level of victimization was, was it in line with other studies, or higher or lower with the group we looked at, or? That's a good question. Um, I don't know if we particularly looked at that. <laughs> well, we had to. I mean, we definitely yeah. looked at it at some point. I don't know we did it. Um, and the comparison to other studies, I'm not quite sure. My guess would be, you know, this is a, fairly affluent um, middle school in a suburban region. Um, it is predominantly white, and I would guess that it would have uh, lower rates, overall rates of victimization than you might see in some inner city schools and stuff like that, but we didn't, we didn't yeah. specifically look at that. And I was just kind of curious because you hear so much about bullying or, or victimization these days, so I didn't know if it was you know, translating into higher reporting and study Yeah, and you, we have this phenomenon today where we're um, sort of sensationalizing extreme cases of bullying and aggression, and so we um, have a perception that the, we, there are lots of these very extreme forms of uh, bullying happening all over the place, and that isn't actually the case. We know that bullying is a very common form of stress, in other words, um, there's almost no kid who will say that they've never been bullied, but uh, the relative rate or average in this school compared to others, I'm not sure. Yeah. One thing that surprised me about the victimization when I was at least looking at our first phase was that girls reported more levels of overt victimization than boys, which was counter to what I had thought, at least when I was that age. And boys reported higher levels of relational victimization than I had. Which is completely opposite of the pattern that's been established in research. So it could just be that we have a very small sample. Um, so we're seeing some bizarre trends in the data. Um, and as we collect more data, some of these trends may disappear and some may emerge. And you know, things may balance out with, with other larger samples. Pre-mean girls, post-mean girls. <laughs> <laughs> With regard to the question asked about the difference in the rates of victimization depending on the student population, has anyone studied um, whether the efficacy of interventions, such as your research suggests, um, for coping strategies in, the, in different populations? So if you have a population in which family structure, the whole ethos supports those kinds of good, positive coping, and maybe another population of the same age kids, your sex support would be found more broadly? Has someone studied that? Not to my knowledge. I think you're speaking to a larger issue, which is that the way that people respond to interpersonal situations may reflect a broader type of social skill, and that broader type of social skill may be related to lower levels of bullying. Is that kind of what you're saying? Uh, maybe. <laughs> um, so I'm just addressing if, if, the, if the, this is an assumption. So in the school that you study, perhaps if, if the interventions of the sort that your research suggests might be helpful are taught to the students, mm -hmm. there may be <laughs> social structures in place that support those where the whole ethos of parents would be affirming and so forth. But in places where there's more victimization and perhaps less, um, <coughs> more fractured families, that you know, less cohesion, chaos, right? Yeah. Um, would those, that's the, the sort of comparison I was asking about whether someone had studied the efficacy of these approaches with kids. 
So you're saying would a bullying prevention program be less effective in a ethos where um, they couldn't promote these adaptive responses? And um, there are a couple of large-scale um, bullying intervention programs out there. Um, and I know that they do take into account kind of family structure, family climate, but I'm not sure if they've also included, you know, this interpersonal stress focus. Um, this is a pretty novel, um, this measure in particular is very um, novel and it's just starting to be integrated across different research paradigms. And I'm pretty certain that um, a bullying prevention program is focused on bullying prevention and not necessarily something like how do we cope generally when we have interpersonal problems. But, yeah. Yeah, I could be wrong. Um, my question is just to verify the timeline that you're using here, because your interventions are assuming then that the stress responses come first before the depression. Is that based on the timeline that you're... Were the depression symptoms measured at time two and then the stress responses at time one? Or? Everything was measured at all three time points, actually. Okay. Yeah. But when you're doing this prediction, you're trying to predict later depression based on earlier stress responses, right? Yes. Coping. Yep. Stuff. Controlling for prior so, levels of depression. Okay. Yeah. So you've got the time going for you. I'm just curious about how you're assuming the causality is going in that direction. Right. And you raise a really good point, which is that not only do maladaptive stress responses predict depression, but kids who are depressed respond maladaptively to stress. And so some research by my grad um, advisor, Karen Rudolph, has actually looked at transactional relationships between depression and stress responses and shown that the paths are significant in both directions. Um, and it does vary by stress response type, and it does vary by uh, gender, which is kind of an interesting finding. But yes, you would expect there to be bi-directional relationships. I don't believe that we looked at these interactions in the opposite direction because we were kind of interested in this idea of victimization as a moderator and predicting depression for whatever reason that was sort of the hypothesis that we came up with that we were interested in but we could look at the opposite direction in, in looking at relational victimization did you consider social media or sort of technological media like that so you mean uh, relational bullying yeah. through Facebook, Facebook. I think there was a question or two about um, that. I believe there were two questions about does anyone bully you over the phone and another one was the internet. So probably, um, I'm assuming someone will come out with another measure that will have more specific questions about that. But yes, relational victimization did include that. Some, some people are specifically interested in this question yeah. of bullying through social media, and so they have more yeah. you know, fine-grained yeah. measures that they use. This is a, just a comprehensive you know, bullying questionnaire that's used all over the place that has 21, 21 items and assesses such a broad range of bullying that you wouldn't expect there to be more than one or two about Facebook. I was wondering, uh, not knowing this, but just in your general sense of having students feel that you see that as, a, as an issue. It's a rising issue, yeah. A lot of people are starting to really focus on, um, you know, some people make the claim that this kind of public social humiliation um, and the threat is more powerful than a one-on-one -on -one interaction between two kids. Yeah. So. Another thing is we're talking about things changing over time. When these students started the study, they were 11 or 12, which technically is too young to be on Facebook. I believe they have to be 13. Mm. <laughs> so there may be some people who um, have it clandestinely, but you, we might see a change of relational victimization as students get more and more of this online social media. I imagine they could find other ways. It yeah. <laughs> doesn't just have to be Facebook. <laughs> yeah, I probably missed this because I came down a little bit late. But when the students took the survey, what was the setting in which were they all taking the survey at the same time, like in a computer lab, or what was? How did that take place? I'm sorry if I missed that. No, that's fine. Yeah, uh, we actually went in with a research team of I believe there were six of us. And all the students took the survey during their social studies class, so we were all in the computer lab together, and they had each uh, computer in front of them, and there was an audio going to read the questions to them. And they kind of went through it as a group, and then there were people on hand to answer questions. 
So there were three teams, and that each team cycled through one computer lab. So we got the entire school in one day, but they were broken into groups of about 30, and we had people proctoring. The, the online questionnaires kids are very, very capable with, um, and we had to try to slow them down to make sure that they were really reading the questions, um, and that was really the challenge. And so, uh, but you know, we went, what was it? 50 minutes, I think, that the survey was, and we, we collected data from 400 people the first time. So it was an extremely efficient way of collecting data. Was there an interaction between the students as they were taking it, or were they? No, they were encouraged, you know, they're told that all responses are private, um, and that they need to respond honestly about themselves, and that they're not to look at their neighbor's responses, and we kind of go through the standard thing with them. That gets harder when they get into high school. They pay less attention to the instructions. And, um, <laughs> so we're at an okay stage here with middle school, yeah. And the victimization in your study is just peer victimization. So yeah. you're, you're not asking about how do they respond to the teacher's need? No, or, but there or, are questions about that too. Okay. And those are, um, those get a lot of resistance from teachers. <laughs> teachers don't want psychologists coming in and asking questions about, is your teacher mean to you? Because then, <laughs> who's the teacher with the highest meanness in the school, and then they get targeted <laughs> by other people? And so we had this issue, actually, when we were designing the study with, we had to go through school administrators and personnel, and we wanted to look at you know quality of teacher relationships, and we were basically told that that would not fly, and that was specifically why. That they didn't want to create a tension among the teachers of feeling that they were being evaluated by the students through our research project. Yeah. So we really, we did confront that issue. Well, if anybody has any more questions, feel free to approach us afterwards. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we had a great time telling you about our research and exploring all the questions.